Good morning, everybody. Michael the Maven here. And in today's episode of the Maven Nation, we're going to be talking about the strengths and weaknesses of every major camera manufacturer that I have personally used. So if somebody was to come to me and they knew nothing about cameras and they'd say, hey, what do these companies do well and what do they not do well? This is the conversation that I would have with them. First, let's thank our sponsors, Proven Nutrition, that makes an incredible pre and post workout drink. I use it every day I exercise and I have lost 35 pounds since I've been on it. It has electrolytes, amino acids, low glycemic. So if you're diabetic, it's totally fine. It tastes amazing and I feel great drinking it. Proven Nutrition has agreed to send you a free sample if you cover shipping and handling, and I'll put that link in the description. Thank you, Proven Nutrition. So this is really a can of worms kind of video because fanboyism is a real thing. We all have our favorite cameras. It's sort of like buying a brand of car or computer is you tend to want to stay loyal to it. And if somebody has any criticisms, you, you tend to take it personally. And I felt the same way. I was a Canon shooter for 12 years, primarily. If you go to my download store, it's called Canon Training Video because the first couple of years I had that, we only did Canon videos. Since that time, I, I've started shooting with Nikons and Panasonic and Sony. And so I have a lot of experience between different brands and I don't say I'm brand specific now. I, you know, I shoot a lot with Nikons and Sonys now more, more than anything. But if Canon came back strong, I would switch back over to Canon for my professional shooting. So let's talk about Canon first. Canon is the big gorilla in the room simply because they have the biggest market share. Even after so many years of being a little less active in the cutting edge part of the tech, but aside from the marketing aspect of it, what does Canon do well better than anybody else? Off the top of my head, the lens selection is the best in my opinion. Not only is the selection great, the quality of lenses across the board, pretty amazing. The entry level lenses, we're talking about for the APS-C cameras, very affordable. You look at that 50 millimeter 1.8, you know, the kit lenses are pretty good for what you're getting. You know, we've got a 10 to 18 now. And so Canon's lens lineup, the ecosystem is astonishingly good. Now, I know there's been some videos recently about color science, but the truth of the matter is I can definitely see color science, and this is coming from somebody who pixel peeps and looks at screens all day. In my opinion, Canon has the best color science when we're specifically talking about flesh tones and reds. There's something about it, it just pops, it just looks more accurate. I don't need to process them, them as much, and I'm very happy with Canon's color tones. Dual pixel autofocus. Canon has probably the best face tracking for live view shooting, for video shooting. The flippy monitor, the way it actually flips around. Panasonic has a version of it, which is very similar, but I, I like Canon's more because of the way you can interact with it combined with those excellent focusing systems. When you look at a camera's flash systems, I also think Canon gets the win. Most of the knockoff versions that I see are modeled after Canon speed lights. And we also have to give credit to Canon for having amazing research and development. And I say that with a little asterisk because they don't always bring that tech out quickly. If you take a look at that 470 flash that actually moves by itself, that's a great example. And there's a, there's a 35 millimeter macro that has built in LED lights. You look at the ND filters they just came out with that drop in to the adapters. Stuff like that, Canon is really good at. If you research their patents, they have a lot of patents for a lot of things in tech that we have never seen. So it sort of feels like, and this is coming into the negative part of it, it feels to me like Canon is holding back. For whatever reason, they're not the tech innovators that they, that they used to be. You know, you look at the 5D Mark II when it came out, that was a revolution by far. And since that time, they've kind of, degressed a little bit in terms of how fast they're bringing this technology out. And that is one of the disappointments I have with Canon. Second thing is I feel like Canon is far behind the game in terms of 4K video. There's not a lot of DSLRs and mirrorless cameras coming from Canon that can shoot 4K and when they do they're heavily cropped. So I feel the 4K is a little bit crippled. Where's the full frame oversampling 4K video on a 35 millimeter digital frame? You know, I, I can't think of anything that that oversamples. And, and so that is one of the huge frustrations. 
And we see in the sensors, I saw it in the 5D Mark IV, I saw it on the EOS R. There's reports of people seeing it in the C300, C200 of this banding issue. So there's some sensor concerns and there's some rumors that the Canon might be going over to Sony, for, at least for the APS-C sensors. I don't know, I guess we'll see, but I'm, I'm concerned about Canon sensors at this point. Next, let's talk about Nikon. Over the years, I have grown to love Nikon cameras and they have come on very strong in the DSLRs, the D5, the, the D850, the D500, those three DSLRs, best focusing cameras I've used in terms of overall accuracy percentage, very impressive. Something else you'll notice about Nikon cameras is they are not shy about implementing an XQD memory card, which translates into incredible buffer performance. If you're a sport shooter and you're looking for accuracy and fast clearing of the buffer, Nikons make a lot of sense. When we look at the sensors across the lineup, especially in their lower end cameras, talking about the D3500, incredible sensors, incredible dynamic range through their whole lineup. Those sensors are mostly manufactured by Sony, and we'll come to that in a second. But if you're looking for performance out of a sensor, very hard to beat Nikon. And another thing I really like about Nikon cameras is the feel of the grip, I love the on off switch around the shutter button. Sony also does that. But the placement of the buttons, the feel, the symbols, all those things make the interaction with the camera pretty intuitive. All this said, the thing that drives me crazy about Nikon cameras is how they implement live view with aperture control in different cameras. Okay, so in, especially this is super frustrating for beginning photographers is that when you are in live view, you can change your shutter speed and your aperture and your ISO, but it doesn't give you an exposure prediction. Now you can turn this on in a movie mode and you can get exposure prediction, but then it locks you out of aperture control. And so if you want to have both exposure preview and aperture control at the same time, for whatever reason, there are some conflicts in most of their lower end cameras. So that is the one gripe I have about Nikon. Second thing, I know people are gonna hate me for saying this, I'm not a huge fan of their color science. I, I will shoot Nikon and I'm happy to use it and I'm happy to edit it, but I feel like it leans a little bit green and a little bit yellow, but usually I can get around that in editing or tweaking my white balance settings. Next, let's talk about Sony. Sony, in my opinion, has been the technology aggressor. They have been very aggressive. Their sensor technology is the best. Nikon uses it. it. When we look at what they did with the A9, absolutely incredible. In order to shoot 20 frames per second, they re-engineered the whole sensor. The oversampling of video from 6K down to 4K, I'm shooting right now on an A7 III. Beautiful video. Look at the bokeh, look at the sharpness, and that's why I, I mainly shoot A7 III right now is because of this look. There's only a couple cameras that can do that at the time of this recording. If you look at Sony's eye detection, it's incredible. You can do sports shooting with the eye detection. I did some tests a couple of weeks ago, over 90% accuracy using eye detection. That's not even what it's for. I don't think any other camera company comes close when it comes to eye detection. And so for portrait photographers, wedding photographers, people who wanna get high percentage of keepers, faster workflow, that eye detection is just a dream come true. Which brings us to many of the negatives about Sony. For a long time, it had a rack zoom problem where you would zoom in during a sports burst mode and it would drop focus. Many of those issues seem to be resolved in the a7 III. There were some overheating problems for the longest time. Many cameras would overheat. I've run into that myself. There's posterization in the compressed RAW files. Uh, the moray and rolling shutter is pretty significant. But the two things that really drive me crazy about Sony cameras are the buffer during a sports mode. It seems like it takes really long to clear the buffer. And famously, the menu systems are just confusing because they're homogenous, they look the same, and it's easy to get lost. Which brings us to Fujifilm. Cameras like the X-T2, the X-T3, beautiful cameras. In terms of the build and the construction, just works of art in my opinion. Many analog controls, no mode dial, and once you get the hang of it, it is a fun, fast camera to shoot. Uh, just a pleasure, it has film simulations, 
Lots of great things to love. The focusing systems for mirrorless cameras, I think Fuji's are the best if you're doing sport shooting. High number of keepers, edge to edge coverage. I think the face detection in the Fuji, especially at high frame rates, is very unique. The customer service is outstanding, reported by myself and other users as well. You call them up and you get stuff resolved fast. Fujifilm also updates their firmware that actually gives you new functionalities. It's one of the only camera companies that will do that, and they'll do it even long after the camera is released. And so that is really appreciated. Most camera manufacturers don't do that. Specifically talking about the X-T3, the processors and the computing power that's put into that camera is really incredible. Combining all this with the relative low cost is that you have this niche camera that for an APS-C is really pulling off a lot of incredible things. It oversamples video as well, just like we're seeing in the Sonys. So really great bang for the buck in terms of the quality that you're getting for how much you're paying. It, which brings us to the negative thing that I don't like about Fuji. It's processing the raw files at higher ISOs. At lower ISOs, I just go through camera raw in Adobe, Photoshop, Lightroom. If you have higher ISOs, you're going to run into some processing differences between Adobe Camera Raw and other third-party raw processors. That's one thing I do not like about Fuji. When we're talking about Panasonic, I believe they are the 4K video leader because they sell it in almost every camera that they make. You can get a G7 for less than $500, brand new, and that shoots 4K video. The reason why Panasonic has an advantage here, I really believe, is that their video codec, there is some pure magic in it. Why? Because they can do 10-bit 422 in camera onto an SD memory card. There's not many cameras that can do that, and the GH5 does it. So there's something about their codec that makes it work. I appreciate that a lot. It has a lot of video-centric capabilities, you know, like a waveform monitor, It'll shoot at 180 frames per second. There's lots of things to like as a video shooter for the GH5, the GH4 systems, which brings us to the negatives. The focusing system in live view on the Panasonics, not all of them, but the GH5 and the GH4 were disappointing for me in, in the ISO performance. So the, the sensors tend to get a little bit noisier once you get up over ISO 800, 1600. So finally, let's talk about Olympus real quick. The thing that I think they do the best is that if, you have a tr if you're going on a long trip, like camping for a month, the OMD EM1 Mark II was very impressive. That's the only camera I've used from Olympus, but it's hermetically sealed. That means airtight. You can pretty much run it under a faucet. It's gonna be fine. The IBIS in that camera was astonishingly good absolutely loaded with features. And you know what, off the top of my head, I can't think of a whole lot to complain about, about the Olympus outside of the, you know, the ISO things with the micro four third sensor and things of that nature. I was pleasantly surprised with it. So in any event, those are the strengths and weaknesses of every major camera manufacturer that I have personally used. I know I missed a lot of things. What do you think the strengths and weaknesses are of the camera companies? Try to keep it objective. You know, let's try to use facts here, but I would love to see those in the comments below. Thank you to our sponsor, Proven Nutrition. If you guys want to try CoreFit, check the link out in the description. And if you found this podcast helpful and you're struggling to learn your camera, check out my many crash courses that can be found at canontrainingvideo.com. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you next time.